Please give it up for John David Dalton. Uh, all right. Everyone's going to see my on screen password. Okay. Hey, it's for convenience. OK. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, John David Dalton. Uh, I created uh, Lodash. Um, so I'm giving you a little bit of a backstory here. Uh, and I got to a, 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 a time in Lodash where it was time to like look at new language features. And I looked around and realized that uh, the browsers were starting to get uh, import export syntax with ES6 uh, syntax support. So that's how many people have used Babel here, uh, or TypeScript, or Webpack, or Rollup, or Parcel? Okay, so like all of them allow you to do some kind of import-export syntax, and it will transpile it back to uh, a format that your browser or node can run. Um, but I wanted to be able to use uh, uh, this in Node and also uh, the browser. And at the moment, Node really didn't have a way to do that. Um, they are working on it. It's experimental right now. Um, but it's a long way from being polished and complete. Uh, so I started working on this uh, ooh, two years ago. Um, and I do a little bit of a code every day. So it's just like every day, ES modules every day. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So meet ESM. So the name is really original. It's ECMAScript module ESM. This is a package you can install. Uh, and there's the short link for it uh, there if you want to npm i ESM. Um, what's cool about this is it's a fast, production-ready, zero-dependency ESM module loader for Node 6 Plus. Uh, what that means is that uh, you don't have to have Node 10. You, don't have to, you can be on Node 6, uh, load this, and you'll get a consistent module experience regardless of your Node version. I, it was Node 4, but like as the, the minimum supported version of Node, uh, was raised, I, I raised support as well. It also allowed me to support more language features. Um, so cool. Getting started. So if you want to create a new ECMAScript module enabled package, what do you need to do? You can do uh, npm init ESM. Uh, the Y flag just answers yes to all of the prompts. Uh, what this does, so npm init has this feature now, kind of like, uh, well, you'll see right below it yarn create that allows you to execute a package, an initializer package. Uh, and so this does that, except it, it feeds back into the init prompt and then auto adds ESM as your package uh, dependency. So you can then write ECMAScript module syntax without Babel or um, heavy transpilation. So cool. This looks built in uh, there. That was by design. I, uh, I added this feature to NPM so you could be able to make it look really built in. Cool. Uh, so this is kind of a new bit here. And this is getting everything up and running. And all you have to do is, uh, if, you are, if you like to deal with like experimental JavaScript and bleeding edge stuff, uh, there is a thing called Tink. And Tink is NPM's experimental CLI. So this is the thing that NPM could become in the future. It's, it's unknown. It's experimental. But uh, Tink allows you to execute uh, code, like the script.js, with the command sh script.js. And if you do that, it's already running ESM behind the scenes. So you can write your ECMAScript ES6 code that you would if you were using Babel or some other bundler or transpiler uh, without having to do anything. And it just works. Uh, Tink also supports TypeScript out of the box and a few other things. Uh, with this, you'll also, uh, it also works with uh, WASM, too. So you can load WASM just like you would uh, any other imported module. So cool. Um, coming soon, if you're a fan of Yarn, uh, there is a, an existing command called Yarn Node. And I found a way to uh, roundabout make it work for that as well. So uh, it's part of your npm init or Yarn create process will add the script that makes this work. Uh, Yarn node is a way for you to um, bootstrap something called plug and play. Plug and play is an optimized form of Yarn that reduces file path lookups by having a, a central registry for your modules instead of a node modules folder in every subfolder. So that's pretty cool. Cool. 
So uh, if you want to explore, exploring is pretty easy. It's just node R ESM. Uh, if you do that, then you'll uh, be put into nodes REPL, and then you can just type import, ex well, not export, but import, uh, import.meta. Uh, dynamic imports work. Um, there is a mode where you can enable uh, top level await and do that in the REPL as well with, uh, I have a demo later on that I'll show you a combo of techniques uh, being used at once. Um, so there's that. So it's pretty easy. It's, it's, I tried to make it as, as short of a command as possible so you can just reach for this without having to feel like you're doing a lot of work. Uh, the package itself is like 200 kilobytes, uh, zero dependency, so you're not pulling in a gigabyte of JavaScript to be able to support your ESM syntax. Cool. Uh, other things, uh, so Babel blazed a couple of paths for us, and one of them was uh, to require a runtime loader for uh, uh, syntax transpilation. So you could do something like Babel register, which allows you to have real-time processing of and, uh, and a translation of your ESM uh, syntax. Uh, well, that allows other tools to be loaded as well, and so you can do things like Mocha R ESM to add ESM support to your unit testing library. Um, hey, you want code coverage? Uh, NYC I ESM gives you that, so you can have code coverage for your ES6 code without having to do anything else. Um, Webpack, if you want to be able to, to write your config files in ES6 too, you, you can do that too uh, with this Webpack R ESM. So, Various tools have uh, a require option, a nodes arg option, or something like that. So you can just, whatever it is, just R ESM tends to work. Great. So zero configuration. So unlike Webpack, well, let's, like unlike old Webpack where you had to this like heavy config and it was like hundreds of lines of code, um, and now Webpack 4 is great. There's a zero config. Uh, ESM is also zero config, uh, which means you can, you can just start using it today without having to do anything. Uh, what's great about it is um, you don't have to think about it. It's, uh, it aligns with how ESM works today. Um, so if you're using Babel or TypeScript or Webpack, um, that kind of syntax works. You don't have to think like, what extension am I using? Uh, do, does named exports work or not? Can I, can I use my mocking libraries and unit testing libraries? All of it just, just works. So uh, it works today, and so this allows you to do um, this implies a couple of different things. Uh, one of them is synchronous loading. So uh, Node's module system, CommonJS, is synchronous. So when you call require, it executes that code and loads that code uh, immediately. Um, and in order to have seamless interop between CommonJS, ESM, uh, WASM, and uh, there's, there's another format which is like a pseudo ESM, uh, having everything be synchronous uh, allows that to, to work. You can basically load your ESM code, export it in a common JS file, and then have other common JS file load it too, without having to have them use the loader. Uh, only your package uses the loader. So it's a way to, uh, for you to write code that uses ESM syntax, uh, but everyone else consuming your code doesn't have to worry about what your code's written in, what your package is written in. Like to them, it's just a module and it just loads. So that's cool. This allows you to have access to, to really handy uh, features like dir name, file name, require. Um, so how many people use require in Node? All right, we have some people. Other people aren't raising your hand and you're lying because everyone uses require. Um, <laughs> uh, well, depending on the implementation you use, you, that may not be available to you. And so ESM smooths over that and says, hey, you're able to do that with Babel today. Today, you, you can write Babel code that says import you know, from uh, a module, but then right below it, you could call require, and it would still work in Node. Uh, so uh, our loader allows you to do that, too. We inject require into the, into the module scope uh, and uh, some of these other variables as well. Um, cool, named exports. So uh, this is another carryover from the ecosystem. You're able to uh, cherry pick methods. So, like, say you're importing Lodash, and you want to only use the pick and the camel case or kebab case methods. Uh, you can say import bracket camel case or kebab case bracket from Lodash. Uh, that is actually a named a, a, a named an import of a named export from CommonJS, uh, and that's there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make that happen. Um, and so I support that. 
so I support that with uh, ambiguous imports too. So you can say export star from common JS package, and then right below that export star from common JS package, and then right below that export star from an ESM package, and they all work. It all resolves and figures out all of that stuff. There's no gotchas. You can use 100% of the syntax of the of uh, ESM regardless of module format that you're consuming, which is pretty cool. So you just don't have to think about it. You get your import, your export, your cherry picking, um, all of that, but then you don't have to just worry about the module that you're consuming uh, there, which is pretty freeing. The other thing is live bindings work. So uh, CommonJS, when you have a module that export, you're putting properties on an object, and you can update the properties on that object. Uh, ESM is different. You are exporting bindings, so like variable bindings. Uh, and then that module, the, the host module, the original, the one that actually exported those things, can update those bindings, those variable values, uh, those identifier values, and then everyone that's consuming it will get updated values as well. And that's live bindings. And so I support that too. I support it with CommonJS as well. Uh, so you're, if your CommonJS export updates, it will update to all of the modules that are consuming it too. Something that you were probably using and not really thinking about because like Babel already supports a form of that today. So you were probably doing it in, and not really considering it, but uh, there's work again to make all of that work seamlessly. Cool. Uh, the other thing I do is lock down uh, MJS extension. How many people have heard of the MJS extension for Node? Cool. Um, so that's part of the experimental support for ECMAScript modules in Node. Um, and because it's experimental, it's not finished, I don't want to uh, provide a false sense of interoperability or compatibility with the ecosystem for it. Um, because if I was to extend functionality to that extension, then people would begin to write code uh, that relies on that with that extension. Um, and that could cause some frustration and confusion when they switch from one loader to like the just node without having a loader used. Um, and you'll see tools like uh, Babel and Webpack also kind of lock down MJS, the MJS file extension, uh, because of that. So if it's .js, you get 100% compatibility. Uh, CommonJS just works. You can load all of these other things. Um, uh, but if it's MJS, it's locked down. So. Again, because you can do all this stuff in .js today, I support it, and then MJS is just locked down. Cool. All right, so yep, basic functionality, no ESM options. So configuration. Um, so it's zero configuration by default, but developers all have opinions, and like really strong opinions about a variety of things, tabs, spaces, uh, semicolons, no semicolons. Um, Lots of things, file extensions, I mean, it just keeps going. Um, so uh, the ESM loader allows you to specify options in a package.json, something you, you might have done for other things. Um, you can do uh, a .esmrc file or slap an extension to that and have it be a .json or a .js or a .mjs, like whatever options file your, your preference is, you can do it. Um, and I, we support loading that. Um, you can do an environment variable. So you can pass ESM options as an environment variable and specify uh, toggles there. Uh, let's see. And then there's also the programmatic API where you can invoke the loader and pass it an options object uh, and customize it that way. So lots of ways to do it. Um, each one kind of satisfies a scenario and a use case. So I, I, it's not like I just threw them all in there. So like, hey, pick it. It's because devs kept running into scenarios where, okay, well, for this, ex uh, for this experience or this scenario, they needed like the environment variable. For another one, they really needed the programming, uh, programmatic API. Um, great. Uh, the ESM loader is, so unlike Babel, uh, which is a transpiler, uh, the ESM loader is a runtime uh, emulator, I, I guess is what it does. So, it, it not only supports the syntax in making that runnable, but it also supports uh, like temporal dead zones. Uh, it's 100% spec compliant, so it runs against the test 262 uh, uh, test suite, which is the test suite that uh, browser or engine implementers uh, test their, their implementations against. So the ESM loader passes all of those uh, applicable tests, uh, which is pretty cool. I just got that in uh, today. 
So all of that's out there. It's, it's, you can use it today. And it's, it, it works with circular references and all of that stuff, which like no one uses, but most of those tests uh, test against. So I've, I've gotten all that covered. Uh, great. But besides that, it's written in JavaScript. So what does that mean? A lot of times people think that if it's in JavaScript, it's got to be slow. It's got to be clunky. Um, it's going to cost me too much to use, right? But mostly JavaScript is mighty good and because uh, there's zero buy-in or tie-in to dependencies. So, hey, uh, you want to ship some new feature. Uh, that means working with standards bodies and various standards, multiple standards bodies uh, or working groups. So there's the Node working group. There's the ECMAScript uh, committees and TC39. Uh, there's WhatWG, there's W3C, uh, there's various other committees, like for example, if you're trying to standardize the .mjs extension, there's a whole like MIME type committee out there, right? And so you can get kind of jammed up with waiting on buy-in from this technical body, that technical body. You'll have people that cross-pollinate, and so you'll have some that are members of multiple bodies, and they will obstruct or uh, have issues with different things, and it ends up creating kind of like a tic-tac-toe game where everyone has it's a draw game, where you can't, there's very limited moves or no moves at all. So by creating this in JavaScript, I don't have to rely on any of them. Uh, uh, I don't have to rely on engines to implement anything, uh, and I can move faster. So that's what zero buy-in and tie-in uh, means, is that you can just, you have a vision, you can implement it, and you're good to go. Great. The next one is faster development. So I, I talked about this already. Um, because it's JavaScript, uh, compile time, super quick. I can test against things like the unit test library for the implementation, which is, you know, runs JavaScript as well. Um, I can look at how things like uh, the common JS uh, interop and ecosystem work. It's all written in JavaScript. So it's a really familiar thing. I don't have to branch off into C++ and try to learn that and try to learn like V8's flavors or you know, chakras flavors or multiple engines flavors of implementations there. It's just JavaScript. Great. Uh, greater ecosystem support. Um, so this implies that you want to do the effort to make it have greater ecosystem support. But because it's written in JavaScript, I can just, uh, I can make it to where you can load CommonJS modules or pseudo ESM modules or ESM modules or WASM modules all in the same system, right? So greater ecosystem support. But it doesn't exclude native. So uh, if there are helpers that become available, so for example, Node has a VM module, and you can tap into that. Like, come, kind of like uh, WebAssembly has a, an object that you can tap into for creating dynamically, uh, dynamic WASM modules. Uh, those APIs can exist for creating other modules, too. And if and when they do, I can tap into them. So it's not exclusionary. Like, it's not like I'll always be uh, JavaScript. I can, I can use native when it's convenient, and then I'm not tied down to it when it's not. Great. So maximizing interoperability. Uh, one of the things I say a lot of times is it just works. It's because if you pick up this package uh, and you follow the instructions, which are like two lines of code, your, your code just works. You don't have to think about like configuration uh, or the kind of uh, content you are consuming. It all just works. Um, so that allows things, when I say just works, I mean things like if you're a node uh, and you have uh, application performance monitors that look for your memory usage and all of that stuff, that, those are written for CommonJS, right? Uh, but they also work with this ESM loader too. So you're not having to, to do anything. You're not having to go to uh, your favorite utility authors and say, hey, I need you to patch your code to make this work. It all just does, uh, which is great. So your performance monitors work. Uh, your code coverage works. So if you're using NYC, all of that stuff works. There's even a, a, a work to make the native code coverage in V8 support this too, because uh, the ESM loader isn't like blazing a path that wasn't already established. The fact that they're going to add source map support to native code coverage will automatically give ESM code coverage support. So it's great. So even that will, will just be baked in uh, without me having to do anything, without them having to do extra work either besides uh, the work that they're doing to support the wider ecosystem. Uh, resolution aliases. So hey, if you're using unit tests, a lot of times you want to say, hey, uh, load this package, but load like the mocked version of this package. 
or load one that is instrumented uh, with more debug code for your unit tests. Uh, you can do that too, and all of that just works. If you rewire it in the same packages that you use in the Node ecosystem to do that, it will automatically work for your import, your dynamic import uh, syntaxes as well, without you having to do anything else. It's just, if, you, if it worked in CommonJS, it works with the ESM loader too, uh, which is pretty cool, because there's lots of tools for that. Like if you're using Jest, uh, Jest has Jest.mock. If you're using Sinon, Sinon has Sinon spies. You can, all of that works too, Jest works. Um, Jest works. Uh, unit testing libraries. So I, I, I said, hey, Jest, uh, I'll get more into Jest later, because Jest is a, its own thing. Uh, but like Mocha works, Jasmine works. Um, all of the things that you, you're used to using in, uh, I think even QUnit works. All the things you're used to using in CommonJS should continue to work through some kind of mechanism to load it. Um, great. Uh, even the Chrome inspector works. So if you are running a node application and then you pass the inspect flag or inspector flag uh, and it opens the, the Chrome inspector, all of that works too. Your logs work. Uh, the code that you're looking at and stepping through in the Chrome inspector is your ESM code. It's not some transpiled mess. You see the code that you wrote uh, and you interact with the code that you wrote, which is super cool. And I've got a demo about, uh, for that too. Uh, great. So. Uh, more than instant and seamless ESM for ESM adoption. So, hey, I created this package. It's great. You should use it. Uh, no one's going to use it. Um, I, it does all this cool stuff. No one's going to use it. Uh, because it's got to be better than uh, great. Uh, so, in this case, I also support things like uh, the entire loader runs in an isolated context. So, nodes, uh, internals, are not isolated. They run in the exact same context your user code runs in. So you can poke at it. Uh, and so what that means is that Node has to do a lot of scaffolding for each file. And it's inconsistent right now because you know, like, running your code in an isolated context is a lot easier than trying to make sure that all of your code doesn't expose bits, right? So uh, this runs in its own isolated context. You can't poke at it. Uh, your, your user code, you can't actually touch the loader. That was one of the things. I wanted it to feel native. So it, since it's isolated, too, it doesn't muck around with the other environment, too. So you can have this as a dependency of your package, and it's not going to globally pollute things. You don't have to worry about it breaking the module system for everyone else uh, or for other projects uh, running in your, uh, your application. Um, the other thing is it reduces pain points. So hey, debugging. Uh, uh, we all need to debug. Uh, the ESM loader makes the errors more readable uh, and pinpoints the exact line of code. So uh, when, a, when an error occurs, it will show you the line of code that the error occurred on and the little character bit of the piece of syntax that it errored at. Um, as ESM is emerging, browsers are also implementing these things too, but uh, I'm able to kind of work at a faster pace there, again, and provide better uh, error messages than you can get from built-in support in the browser or in Node. Uh, so I try to go the extra mile there and give you really meaningful error messages. Uh, so it, it not only says like, hey, this, e this import or export doesn't exist, it says the module it belongs to. And sometimes that can be confusing because you can have an import, uh, a, a binding that has an error that could be one of 20 modules that you imported, right? And so this really narrows that down. Uh, the other thing is improved performance. All right, so this has like an asterisk next to it. You can get improved performance, and I'll show you a shout out later that, that talks about it. So hey, this is JavaScript. Uh, native is always faster, uh, right? Uh, not necessarily the case. So with Lodash, I, I proved that at the time that you could write JavaScript code that was faster than JavaScript methods or built-in methods. Um, and in this case, uh, there is a way to get faster than native performance too. It's not there yet, but it will be in 2019. So keep an eye on that. Uh, the performance I'm talking about here is, hey, you're having to, normally you're having to use Babel, right? Which is like, I don't know, 500 megabytes plus of dependencies. Uh, then you have to transpile, uh, right? Which adds to your, your build times, your CI times, your test times. Uh, you can pull all of that out, just right out. Uh, and then you're left with something that is really fast. Um, and I'll get into why and how it is fast a little bit later. Uh, cool. Uh, power up. 
So uh, remove artificial barriers and empower developers with modern syntax. So ESM also works with uh, full stack, um, which that means is that you can use this for things like um, server-side rendering. Uh, ESM loader works for that. In fact, if you're using Svelte, which is an artisanal library created by the same developer that does roll up Rich Harris, uh, it, it uses ESM for its server-side rendering support uh, there. So you're writing code that is meant for the browser, but it loads with this loader. Super cool. Um, it's real time, so there's uh, some extensions for VS Code that as you type, it will give you inline error like linting and things like that for ESM syntax support. And the ESM loader is running in VS Code for that extension and it works. Like, you don't notice a lag when you're using it because it's that fast, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then also serverless, so the ESM work, uh, solution works on uh, Azure, Google Console, um, AWS, Whatever, it works, all of it. It's pretty cool, um, super great. Uh, baked in, no installation necessary. So uh, ESM is starting to get adopted by the tools you use as part of your development process. So Ava has ESM integrated for reading its config files. You can also drop Babel and it will use uh, ESM that way. Uh, Tink, I mentioned before, the experimental CLI uh, is, uh, has ESM built in so you can do things like load your ECMAScript modules, common JS modules, uh, and WASM modules all loading each other together. Uh, coming soon, I'm reaching out to the uh, Mocha's uh, leads, and uh, then Node Tap will also have it baked in. Uh, the, the, the Quokka and Wallaby are those uh, VS Code extensions that have it baked in. Great, so cool, shout outs. So here's a shout out that was about performance. So hey, I'll just like zoom in there. It says I wanted to say a quick thank you. I was able to, uh, take our time from 30 minutes plus down to 10 minutes, and uh, build times from 20 seconds to three seconds. And the ESM loader played a big part in that. So that's the performance bit, it is like, great. You, you're, you're, everything that you're using to generate your tools and, or test your applications can be reduced in terms of the overhead of time it takes. Uh, then the other one, hey, is this one here, where it says, hey, it's, ESM is simultaneously the craziest hack I've ever seen, and also one of the best examples of making things just work. It feels native, uh, behind the scenes it's doing some other things, but for you as a user, it, it should just work like native and you don't have to worry about it. So that's cool. So what's next? Uh, I think I mentioned this before, but oh, I, I didn't. This is uh, Jest support, it was supposed to be released today. I had some problems, so I'll, uh, maybe this weekend it'll be there. So you, can, you don't have to have Babel Jest to be able to support your ESM code in your unit test, you can just use ESM as a transform option and it will just work. Uh, then there's also coming a Jasmine helper for this too. Great, uh, and then again, I found a way to get it 20% faster than native uh, in a proof of concept. Ha, ah, uh, if I get like even just 5% faster than native, it's a win, so I'm super happy about that. Uh, you'll see more of that coming. Uh, deeper dive, okay, I'm gonna break out because I got time limits. Um, all right, so first, hey, uh, this is an Electron talk. Let me show you working in Electron, how about that? Um, okay, da, 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 NPM start. So I've modified the Electron quick start. And okay, ta-da, that's it, it's running ESM code. You can see here, it's import log from console. Uh, it's got the debug. Uh, there, you're able to see the log function, all of that. Uh, hey, I actually console logged here, and when I, cl I console logged in the renderer, and when I click on the renderer link here, it goes to the, the actual uh, source code, the spot in the source code where I did that, and you notice it's the ESM code too. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, again, seamless ESM support. Uh, let me go ahead and show you what that actually looks like for Y'all, uh, here's, here's the line of code you have to do to make ESM code work in the renderer process. It's a single line of code, it's, that's it. There you go, all your code, your ESM code just works in the renderer process that is then loaded here. Uh, in your main process, uh, it's a similar, similar story. One line of code, tweak, and then you, you load your, your ESM related code. You can see here I just said, hey, change that import uh, there. Uh, I added the dependency, and that was it. And then a little bit of a hello world here. So 
It's pretty simple to get started. It's like one line, two lines of code that you add that then allows you to have a consistent module loading experience across the, the main and renderer processes. You don't have to worry about that in the, the renderer process, the file protocol isn't supported for imports. You don't have to worry about the, the lack of bare imports in the renderer process or the fact that uh, whatever works in the renderer process doesn't work in the main process. It's consistent ESM support in both, writing the exact same code. So you can even have code that is in the main process and move it later on to the renderer process. You don't have to change anything syntax-wise uh, there for that. So that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing I want to show you is, uh, so along the lines of it being like native, I went ahead and you can compile Node with ESM built in. And it's, again, like four lines of code change. So here's a demo of that. Um, let's look at this. I'm going to enable experimental, uh, the experimental top level await in the REPL. Um, and let me zoom in here so you can see this. Zooming in, zooming in, zooming in more. OK. Let's see, I'm spoiling. Don't look. Um, great, so right here, I'm saying, hey, let add. Uh, I'm destructuring this import for default into uh, add 10, and I'm doing a top level await of a dynamic import loading a WASM file. All right, this WASM file is itself loading an ESM module with a .js extension, and it's all just working. Well, is it? I don't know. I mean, there's the syntax. Let's see what happens. Um, great. So then I'm going to try the add function. One, two, hey, three. I'm going to try the add 10 function. Whoop, whoop. I wonder if it auto completes. Hey, it does. Great. So let's do 13. There, 23. So it's working. You didn't have to do anything. You just get to write your code and use it. Uh, in this case, for the top level stuff, I had to actually build that in. Node has some limitations on that. So uh, for your normal use, you're probably not going to want to do that. Uh, but you can do top level await uh, in your entry scripts for CLI utils and stuff uh, with a opt in to that for the ESM loader. So cool. There's that. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. I will get back to the presentation. Um, so, how does this work? Uh, what you're creating is a bridge between two module formats. You have CommonJS, you have ESM, and they are fundamentally incompatible with each other. Uh, one needs to have everything before execution, like its bindings, uh, its resolve, its uh, module paths validated, and all of that stuff. Uh, and one, you don't find out about that stuff until after the code executes. Common JS, you don't know what you're ex exporting until the code executes and you've exported it, right? So you need this bridge to be able to handle the difference between them. And this is, again, where synchronous loading comes into play because the Common JS isn't going to expect a promise, right? You expect your code to be loaded uh, when you call require. So what you do here is you uh, create a new require with the ESM loader. Uh, and now you can then module.exports any of your ESM code, and then any other common JS file can load it just fine. They don't have to know what it's doing. Uh, and this is what's called the bridge there, because it's a common JS bridge. Your actual code looks like this, export and uh, A, export default there. Um, cool. Uh, this is uh, extra sugar on top. Uh, your ESM bridge can then also be run by Babel code. So certain testing uh, utils and environments will take the code you write and then run that code in neighboring code through Babel. And Babel expects ES modules to have an underbar ES module property. And so uh, by default, we add that as well. So you can interact with this ESM bridge with transpiled ESM code and it all just works. So you're all writing ESM syntax and behind the scenes your tools are doing this or that and you don't have to worry about it. It's all still just working. So in this case, uh, you have a, uh, a, an export here and then inside Babel it's still able to load that even through over the bridge. Uh, you can have multiple instances of this loader. You can create one that does top level await, one that has no CJS interop, uh, one that treats all code as ESM. You have multiple instances. Uh, the instances can share information, some information uh, as well, which is pretty cool, and that's an optimization technique. Um, pipeline, it's synchronous. There's parse, there's validate, uh, there's instantiate. 
okay? And then probably, uh, uh, I said parse, validate, instantiate, and evaluate. There we go. Execute, evaluate. Um, for unambiguous, hey, if it's MJS, it's module goal. Uh, if not, then I look for import, export, import meta, use module directives, uh, then I also parse it as a module. So most of the time you're writing code that has import, export anyways, and you're wanting it to be treated like an ES module. Uh, you can also, then if not, it, it's script goal. Uh, CJS interop, uh, resolve module specifiers. If module goal, then validate the requests and export bindings up front. Um, let's see, else punt to after the evaluation phase. Um, so behind the scenes, there, it's actually like instantiate plus evaluate. Um, you can link up things, but for function bindings to be hoisted, you have to evaluate and then yield. Kind of, uh, this is how V8 does it. They create a, a module that is actually a generator function that yields uh, before the actual, the body of your module uh, evaluates, and so you can then get all these bindings up front. So I support all of that. Let's see. You evaluate, uh, you evaluate the, the sorry, val uh, validate the CJS exports, populate the bindings. Um, so caching, I cache loader data, I cache the transforms, I cache the metadata for those files, I cache the engine code cache from the executed code. So like, just, if there's an opportunity to cache, I cache, and that helps with performance and repeat performance. This is why it's faster than Babel and other things, uh, which is super cool. Um, experimental, so you can use top level await with Node 10 plus uh, with the ESM loader. Uh, the reason is because behind the scenes I use async generators, which wasn't supported until Node 10. Um, cool. The other thing is, um, you can read more about that. I push through allow await outside so you can write code that is lintable with top level await uh, because before then your linters would error and say like, hey, you can't write that. Um, the other thing is WASM support in Node 8 Plus, I believe, uh, and then you can read more whenever I publish my slides on what that is uh, there. Cool. Uh, the reason they're not on by default, these two, is because they're still experimental and I don't want to commit to something that m might change there. It's, it's again like where's the ecosystem at today and what am I going to want to support? Well, uh, today uh, there isn't like solid support for top level await and like the module story as, as Lynn pointed out was uh, still being ironed out so I don't want to like lock that in. But you can opt into it totally and try it out and, and it all works which is pretty cool. Even together, top level away plus WASM modules works. Great, so thank you. That's, uh, that's my talk. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, the repo, standard things, ESM, uh, release blog post, and like a, a deep dive into ES modules, which breaks down like all the parts and phases and complexities of the module system. Um, great, so uh, questions? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. This was way more exciting than anything I was hoping or expecting for. So cool. this is great. Uh, I also see that essentially, uh, well, the way you saw this, uh, this talk, like ES6 modules for Electron, it's, it's just really a small subset of everything you can do with this, as you called it, uh, runtime emulator, right? Yes. And, and it's really exciting and all, but my question, and because I've never heard of this before. Yeah. Uh, how much, or uh, how's your community support regarding this? Is it just you working on this alone? Do you have any sort of institutional support? So I do. Uh, what will happen if you die tomorrow? So, um, well, no, so I, I, uh, I, I like cashed in my Lodash cred, and uh, Microsoft lets me work on this like every day. Um, are you at Microsoft? Yeah, oh, hey, I'm at Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so uh, they, they, they let me work, they, they, I, I was able to appeal and say like, hey, this is a problem that hasn't been tackled by the ecosystem, no one's really tackling it yet, uh, and, and we need something, right? And so this is that something that you can use and start to adopt. Uh, it also helps proof out the standards process, so um, the node module working group is working on ways to create like a dynamic module, which is like some behind the scenes stuff for getting common JS to work with ESM. And the ESM loader can proof that stuff out and say like, yeah, this will totally work or no, probably not gonna work. So I've already been able to prove out uh, areas there. Um, 
Uh, in terms of, of, of adoption, it's got over 2 million downloads, uh, over 600 modules, uh, and then, of course, NPM is an early adopter of it, and so once they lock in, that's millions and millions of people that'll probably start using it without even realizing they're using it, because it all just works. Um, in terms of, of uh, the, the fundamental driver of the development, that's a lot of it's me. I, I, I have worked on a way to not burn out and to just keep doing a little bit of code every day, and so I just do a little bit of code every day. Um, people have popped in, though. Uh, I had a user contribute all of the test 262 uh, tests for the compliance tests. They figured out a way to import the tests, rework the harness, get it all to where I could run it within Mocha, and, and that helps so much. And then you have other people that go through, and they, they let me know when, like, Puppeteer breaks, uh, which, oh, hey, we work with Puppeteer. Um, uh, or the inspector breaks, or um, uh, uh, a performance monitoring uh, uh, app or, or utility revved, and they need some extra support here. So, uh, Cindrasource has helped out. He's, he's uh, on my, my list of uh, possible contributors, but I really I like to bounce stuff off of him since he represents a large chunk of the ecosystem. He can help me with that. And of course, Ava is an early adopter, which is his unit testing library of ESM2. So, if you're using Ava, you're probably already using ESM and not really knowing it. Cool. Um, other questions? No other questions. Everything just no works. More. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. Just is it production ready? Would you say? Yeah. Totally. I mean, it's got uh, it's got over a thousand plus unit tests, uh, scenario tests for regressions. Um, performance is microseconds from native. Um, but I want to get it more. <laughs> like, it's so close. Uh, uh, and there's ways for me to do it. And, and I think in 2000, the, this year, I'll be able to do that and get that. So that's the only really thing that is really left. My, the, the things that I wanted to accomplish uh, up till now were like getting it 100% spec compliant, uh, which is super complex with uh, circular module dependencies and when bindings are in temporal dead zone and all of that stuff, but was able to get all of that stuff worked out. Function hoisting during the instantiate phase when no code has been evaluated, all of that stuff, it all works. Like you don't have to think about it. And uh, it's, it's above and beyond anything that exists in like a transpiled kind of thing. So yeah, totally production ready. Uh, it does work on resource limited air environments like uh, serverless environments too. Um, I have seen some scenarios where memory does spike, but it's usually like when you're using a cluster module and you've, you've, in, you've accidentally required the loader in like all of your clusters and you're not using it uh, kind of thing. So that's, uh, that, that's that. Other than that, though, not, not a big problem there. I'm always working on performance, though, and improving that. So yeah, totally production ready. It's in the thing. Uh, it's production ready and it's safe to use uh, it, it, since it is isolated. You don't have to worry about it like a Babel register is something you don't want to use in production, right? Because it pollutes the global module loader. Uh, ESM can be run as a package level loader or an application level loader. And as a package level loader, it is completely isolated. You're, none of your code is actually running through the node module system at that point. It's all running through ESM. Um, so it doesn't touch any of that stuff, which is cool because uh, node introduces breaking changes between versions to some of the loading pipeline. In ESM, since it's the same loader for all the versions, it's a consistent experience. And sometimes I can actually add uh, utilities that only certain versions of Node get, but because your code is all being run through mine, you'll be able to get it regardless of if you're Node 6, but that method was added in like Node 8. Uh, you'll do that. So I mean, you can run as a application level loader, and that does top into the, the, the global system. But at, the, in that, at that point, you're not worried about polluting, because you, you own the entire Node process at that point. So, so yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. Uh, let's just break for 10 minutes. We're a little over time. Um, but JDD will be around, maybe? Yeah, totally. Cool. All right, cool. Let's All break right, for 10 thank minutes. Thank you.